Hello everyone, and welcome back to more ASMR with me, Mr. Eeps. I hope you've all had a good week. I hope you all are relaxed. I hope you all are enjoying your Friday night. Um, the last video, I think, was kind of rushed, so I'm trying to make this one a little less rushed. There's going to be some head scratching, as well as reading. We'll get to that soon enough. But first, I just want to take some time to talk with you guys, to say hello. some new people in the group, and I'd like to welcome you because I didn't really do that last time, so thank you for joining us. If you've been having a rough week, then take this time to relax, to unwind. Let yourself fall into a dream, fall into sleep, or just enjoy a new world with us in David Copperfield. For now, enjoy some head scratches.
still alright, if you remember the last time we left off. Kind of in the middle of chapter 3, I think it was. I'm not sure how much more we have to go to the end. So this video, this video is just going to finish the chapter. It might be longer, it might be shorter, it might be the same, we'll see what happens. Either way, I hope you enjoy. Let's see, where were we? Here we go. So the fortnight slipped away, varied by nothing but the variation of the tide, which also altered Mr. Peckety's times of going out and coming in, and altered Mr. Ham's engagements also. When the latter was unemployed, he sometimes walked with us to show us the boats and ships, and once or twice he took us for a row. I don't know why one slight set of impressions should be more particularly associated with a place than another, though I believe this obtains with most people, in reference especially to the associations of their childhood. I never hear the name, or read the name of Yarmouth, but I am reminded of a certain Sunday morning on the beach, the bells ringing for church, little Emily leaning on my shoulder, Ham lazily dropping stones into the water, and the sun, away at sea just breaking through the heavy mist, and showing us the ships like their own shadows. At last the day came for going home. I bore up against the separation from Mr. Peggotty and Mrs. Gummidge, but my agony of mind at leaving little Emily was piercing. We went arm in arm to the public house where the carrier put up, and I promised on the road to write to her. I redeemed that promise afterwards in characters larger than those in which apartments are usually announced in manuscript, in manuscript as being to let. We were greatly overcome at parting, and if ever in my life I have had a void made in my heart, I had one made that day. Now all the time I had been on my visit, I had been ungrateful to my home again, and had thought little or nothing about it. But I was no sooner turned towards it than my reproachful young conscience seemed to point that way with a steady finger, and I felt all the more for the sinking of my spirits that it was my nest, and that my mother was my comforter and friend. This gained upon me as we went along, so that the nearer we drew, and the more familiar the objects, objects became that we passed, the more excited I was to get there, and to run into her arms. But Peggotty, instead of sharing in these transports, tried to check them, though, ki though very kindly, and looked confused and out of sorts. Blunderstone Rookery would come, however, in spite of her, and when the carrier's horse pleased, and did, how well I recollect it, on a cold grey afternoon with a dull sky, threatening rain. The door opened, and I looked, half laughing and half crying in my pleasant agitation for my mother. It was not she, but a strange servant. Why, Peggotty, I said ruefully, isn't she come home? Yes, yes, Master Davy, said Peggotty. She's come home. Wait a bit, Master Davy, and I'll, I'll tell you something. Between her agitation and her natural awkwardness in getting out of the cart, Peggotty was making a most extraordinary festoon of herself, but I felt too blank and strange to tell her so. When she had got down, she took me by the hand, led me wandering into the kitchen, and shut the door. Peggotty, said I, quite frightened, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter, bless you, bless you, Master Davy, dear, she answered, assuming an air of sprightliness. Something's the matter, I'm sure. Where's Mama? Where's Mama, Master Davy? repeated Peggotty. Yes. Why hasn't she come out to the gate? And what have we come in here for? Oh, Peggotty! My eyes were full, and I felt as if I were going to tumble down. Bless the precious boy, cried Peggotty, holding, taking hold of me. What is it? Speak, my pet. Not dead, too? Oh, she's not dead, Peggotty! Peggotty cried out, No! with an astonishing volume of voice, and then sat down and began to pant, and said I'd had, I had given her a turn. 
I gave her a hug to take away the turn, or give her another turn in the right direction, and then stood before her, looking at her in an anxious inquiry. "'You see, dear, I should have told you before now,' said Peggotty, "'but I hadn't an opportunity. "'I ought to have made it, perhaps, but I couldn't exactly. "'That was always the substitute for exactly in Peggotty's militia of words. "'Bring my mind to it.' "'Go on, Peggotty,' said I, more frightened than before. "'Master Davy,' said Peggotty, untying her bonnet with a shaking hand and speaking in a breathless sort of way. "'What do you think? You have got a paw!' I trembled and turned white. Something, I don't know what or how, connected with the grave in the churchyard and the raising of the dead seemed to strike me like an unwholesome wind. "'A new one,' said Peggotty. "'A new one?' I repeated. Peggotty gave a gasp, as if she were swallowing something that was very hard, and putting out her hand, said, "'Come and see him.' "'I don't want to see him. "'And your mama," said Peggotty. I ceased to draw back, and we went straight to the best parlor where she left me. On one side of the fire sat my mother. On the other, Mr. Murdstone. My mother dropped her work, and arose hurriedly, but timidly, I thought. "'Now, Clara, my dear,' said Mr. Murdstone, "'recollect.' Control yourself. Always control yourself. Davy boy, how do you do? I gave him my hand. After a moment of suspense, I went and kissed my mother. She kissed me, patted me gently on the shoulder, and sat down again to her work. I could not look at her. I could not look at him. I knew quite well that he was looking at, bu looking at us both, and I turned to the window and looked out there at some shrubs that were drooping their heads in the cold. As soon as I could creep away, I crept upstairs. My old dear bedroom was changed, and I was to lie a long way off. I rambled downstairs to find anything that was like itself. So altered it all seemed, and roamed into the yard. I very soon started back from there, for the empty dog kennel was filled up with a great dog, deep-mouthed and black-haired like him, and he was very angry at the sight of me, and sprang out to get at me. And that's the end of chapter three. I know that wasn't very long today, but I'd like to try to end each of these videos kind of in a place that's like where we picked up. Or in a place that uh, creates a natural stop. And I'd like them to not run a little any longer than they need to, 30 minutes at most. Although, if the chapters get long or short, I may change that. We'll see how each video does. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I hope you enjoy listening to me read, if you've seen this one and seen the other ones. If you do, please like, share, subscribe, do all of that. In the meantime, 